Welcome to Harlem Stage and our Dive Deeper Conversation Series, a space for generative conversations around the brilliant work created by artists of color. I'm Monique Martin, Director of Programming. Today, we're honored to bring the work of Afro-Swedish musician and author Jason Timbuktu Diakate. His best-selling book, Turned Play, A Drop of Midnight, is our next Waterworks Commission project. It was scheduled to premiere on March 30th, then moved to October 13th, and now we have postponed it until 2021 as we all navigate the global pandemic of COVID-19. So please keep in touch with us, check in on our website for the premiere date for 2021. Jason is one of Sweden's most well-known and respected hip hop artists. He released his first music in 1996 and has since released eight solo albums, many of them reaching gold and platinum status. In 2016, he wrote and released his first book, The Critically Acclaimed, A Drop of Midnight, which has sold more than 100,000 copies in Sweden. The book tracks his family's history from the slave plantations of South Carolina to Harlem and the welfare state of Sweden. It is now available in the US published by Amazon Books. It was released on March 1st, so you too can have a copy of A Drop of Midnight at your favorite bookseller. So please pick up a copy and you'll be all caught up for the premiere. Serving as dramaturge on this project is Jonathan McCrory, an OB, two-time Obie Award-winning Cranes New York Business 2020 notable LGBTQ leader, a Harlem-based artist. He serves as artistic director at the National Black Theater, one of our cultural partners here in Harlem since 2012. He is known as a creative doula, shepherding projects from incubation all the way through production. Guiding the conversation is Monica Miller, a professor of Africana Studies and English at Barnard College, Columbia University, a specialist in contemporary African-American and Afro-diasporic literature and culture, cultural studies, and the author of the award-winning book, Slaves to Fashion, Black Dandyism and the Styling of Black Diaspora, Diasporic Identity. She is at work completing her next book, Blackness, Swedish style, race, diaspora, and belonging. So as we all navigate the concurrent pandemics of COVID-19 and structural racism, how has this current time influenced your artistic practice? Walk us through the developmental process from ideation to manifestation, from page to stage, as they say. How do you translate a personal story into a universal truth? How do you build a creative team? This and more will be discussed in this conversation. I will now turn it over to Monica Miller. Thank you. Here we go. I'll start again. <laughs> this is a pleasure, and I'm very, very happy to be here with Jason and Jonathan. And mm -hmm. um, I have been thinking, as Jason knows, um, I have been thinking about his book and thinking about the book as performance, um, both in Sweden and in the US um, for, um, for a little bit. So this is super exciting for me to be able to talk with you both today about um, A Drop of Midnight. Um, last spring when Jason was here in New York, he was also in, involved in a course that I was teaching. And during that course, we were talking a lot about music and its relationship to Afro-diasporic identity and its relationship to kind of transnational identities and transnational flows of culture. And while we were doing some reading, I came across this quotation that I thought was, would be really useful and interesting to think about in relationship to Jason's book and into this, um, and to the different iterations that the book has taken over time. So this is Harlem Renaissance writer, Jean Toomer, who wrote um, in 1937, a question. What man full of song wants to keep it to himself? There are no misers in music. The singer is not content to sing only for himself. By law of his being, his deepest urge is to share his song with others. Yeah. So I've been thinking about that uh, non-miserly urge, right? That musicians <laughs> have. To right? share. And yeah, the sharing, right? And I'm yeah. also thinking about song, right? Both mm. as a kind of oral phenomenon, you know, heard and sung, mm. right? But also the way that the song is a text, 
right? Um, mm -hmm. It often can have a written form, right? And is, a, is, and is a performative act. So I wanted to think about and think with Jason and Jonathan about what it means to take Jason's memoir, right? Move it into a performance, both in Swedish and English, right? And then recite it, right? Um, recite mm -hmm. it in Harlem and at Harlem, um, Harlem stage. So I wanted Jason just to go back a little bit and ask Jason, why was it important for you to write the write your memoir, write a drop of midnight when you did? And that was back in two thousand. I think you started in fourteen, right? I, I started actually right at the outset of two thousand fifteen, and okay. uh, I had just turned forty, and the a kind of the the space opened up where I was I was kind of at a loss to where I was creatively going to take my you know. My music. I wasn't feeling inspired to 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 write anything musically. Mm -hmm. uh, my nephew had just gotten. He was still a little baby. Had gotten really, really ill. I live in Stockholm, which is the capital of Sweden, and it's about four hundred miles from where where my <clears throat> where my family lives in the south of Sweden. So I was going back down to the south, like once a week, basically. Just you know. Uh, to just support my family and my sister and everything that they were going through with their baby being sick. So I was having a cup of coffee with my dad one day and he told me a story of how in 1965, he drove from Harlem, where he was born, Harlem, New York, Harlem, USA, um, to Harlem, Georgia, to he was going to move to his then girlfriend who who came from and lived in Harlem, Georgia. And first of all, I, I didn't know there was, you know, I knew there was a Harlem in Holland, but I didn't know there was another Harlem in the United States. Uh, and he, outside of Lexington, South Carolina, he gets stopped by a state trooper. Uh, they, they, it, the state trooper hands him off to the sheriff. They take his car. Um, all because his car had a broken window. And, and also at, in 1965, just like in 2020, they, they don't need any reason to uh, stop a black person. Like the, the authorities don't need much of a reason to stop a black person, uh, whatever they're doing. Mm -hmm. And my dad was without a car in, in rural South Carolina, 1965. Uh, he, uh, and he had to take the bus to Harlem, Georgia the next day, but he had to spend the night in a local motel. And he was scared that uh, he was scared that the, the sheriff or whoever was going to come for him in the night, you know, and string him up in a tree. Which is also a very real thing <clears throat> at the time, you know, today lynchings are done uh, differently. But but um, so he didn't dare spend the night in his room. He climbed a tree outside, you know, ironically, he climbed a tree for safety and spent the night in the tree. Uh, and then the next day he climbed down and got on the bus and went to Harlem, Georgia. It, it was such a dramaturgically perfect anecdote and story and tragic and, and, and also funny. And, you know, so I wrote it down and I just realized that, let me see what, you know, all these stories that I grew up hearing of, of my family, you know, from both my mom and dad, uh, let me write the, start writing them down and collect, collecting them. So mm -hmm. that's, that was basically how it started. And I think formulating the, my why was, wasn't difficult. I think my why was basically just for deeply personal reasons of wanting to just map out what, what my family, what my roots look like, uh, what they felt like, uh, and, and w w where they stretch to, you know. But as I got deeper into the project, I started formulating some higher ideals for it, like, well, you know, explaining why a person looking like myself, how, how I how could end up in this so very white country uh, called Sweden. Mm -hmm. And also um, thinking about my, at that point, you know, uh, unborn child, you know, someday I would have uh, children and that this was an offering for my, for my child. Now I have a two-year-old daughter. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, uh, you know, I started formulating that idea as a why, you know, for my, for my future children. And then also in the back of my mind, you know, that lonely black, child black or brown child somewhere in in rural sweden who feels all alone in the world 
and and doesn't know what to do with themselves or how to maneuver or navigate uh, here, just to let them know that they're not alone. Yeah, I guess I mean I really I mean all of the things that you all of those different stages and ideas that you talk about are so fully realized in the book, right? I mean in terms of um, in terms of narrating the story of you growing up in Sweden and what it was like to be one of so few children of color, right? Mm -hmm. and, and even, you know, and an immigrant, right? Because your parents are both American, right? Um, and not Swedish. That other kind of impulse to talk about your own family history's roots, both here in the United States and then also, you know, your father lived in Africa for a time in Nigeria and, mm -hmm. um, and kind of tracing your ancestry um, back. I mean, the book is also a really interesting, I think, um, kind of chronicle of the early, early moments of Swedish hip hop, right? Mm. I mean, in terms mm. of you, um, in terms of you being, a, you know, one of the major figures of the early moments of that, and that there's certain aspects of the, of the of book that cover those kinds of things as well. So mm. um, you see all of that, um, you see all of that in the, in the book and in, um, in really, you know, kind of, amazing way. So the, the book has so many kind of languages and threads that mm. um, that one can see how it lends itself or could lend itself really well to performance. So how did it move from a memoir, right, to theater? Mm. Right? And I've been thinking about, you know, what are the kinds of things that, <laughs> <laughs> what are the kinds of things that, you know, that performance can do, right, mm. that that a that a memoir or a novel can't right and i mean apart from the fact that you are you know a hip-hop artist and are used to the stage and like the stage is you know a very comfortable place for you to be um you know singing in that way is really different yeah. from from performing on the stage the beauty of of the book is that it's so private right that yeah. you choose the speed at which you read, you choose the location of where, when you open the book that you set out to read, you choose your associations and, and the picture, the movie that plays in your head is your own personal movie when you're reading a book. And I, I, I kind of, I love books so much for, for that movie that, that moving books inspire, but also for the privacy of how you, consume a book. Um, the stage performance is, is at the total opposite end. It's such a physical uh, uh, event to, to witness a stage, to, to mm -hmm. be in the audience and to be on stage. Is, is re and it's a coming together. It's, a, it's something collective where, as you were saying in the, in the Gene Toomer uh, quote, you know, um, you know, the stage what's happening on the stage is not, you know, it's being confirmed by it being heard by other living humans, you know, who are, who are in the audience. So, so and, and having lived so much of my life on stage, it, it was almost like it didn't, it wouldn't become real unless I, you know, took it back onto stage. Uh -huh. However, uh, it was actually something born of, of uh, a little insecurity on my part because uh, Marcus Samuelson said when the, the Swedish book uh, was released in 2016, he said, but let's, you know, let's have a release party at Ginny's and, uh, you know, for, for whoever wants to come. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. And he said, and you can read from the book. And I, at that point, hadn't done a reading. I was like, wow. You know, to me, that was something totally new. Like what I just sit and like read from the read? book and people will actually be quiet and listen. Uh, yeah. My friend Eric, my friend Eric, however, <laughs> was also living in New York at the time. And I didn't tell people that I was uh, writing this book. I, I told my uh, parents because I needed to get, you know, the stories from them, but I didn't tell anyone else that this was really a seed that got to grow in the dark until mm -hmm. it pushed its leaves out, you know? Um, so, somewhere halfway through, I started telling people that I was working on a book project and what it was about. And Eric started sending me these pieces of music, you know, you know, he's, he's thinking of, of my ancestry and, and like Malian music and, and uh, uh, Duke Ellington inspired pieces mm -hmm. and Swedish folk music. And he was just, you know, uh, sending me this music. And so I called him up and I said, Marcus wants me to do a, a, 
we're having a book release at Ginny's. Wouldn't it be beautiful if you played some music uh, of the pieces you've written inspired by what, what you think my book is about while you know, I read? You did this all the time. You're aware of this, right? What's that? Langston Hughes did that all the time. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah. I, I had no, you know, uh, as, <laughs> as I saw it as venturing into this new kind of discipline and, and also not really identifying as a writer. I just have, am a person who's written a book. I think I have to write a couple before I truly can call myself a writer. But, but um, so he came, we, we sat at Ginny's, I read from the book, he played. We also invited uh, Gil and uh, Rakim Walker and the Rakim Walker Project. I said, you know, I'll read from the book, Eric will play, and, uh, and then we'll segue into, you know, I'll mm -hmm. sing a song, and then maybe we go back into some more reading and then sing another song. And we did that, and I was like, hey, we, you know, and it was great. It was, I, I had an amazing time. I think the audience appreciated it. And I was like, we could do this for 90 minutes. This could be, you know, <laughs> this, could be, this could be a show. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, that, and thus the idea was born. Mm -hmm. That's so great that you say this could be a show. That is such a theater person thing to say, right? So you say that I, you're not a writer, right? And yeah. you and you you say that you know you're not a, a performer in that way, but you clearly all of the language is there, right? I mean, you you are um, working uh, working with all of that. So let's let's. Um, switch. My idea at yeah. the time was that I would literally sit on stage with the book. Yeah. There'd be music playing. I'd read, then I'd go up and sing a song. I was like. And it'll be a super easy project to do. Sure. Um, when I met the, the director of the Swedish version, Farnas, the first thing she said was like, oh, no, no, you won't be having a book. I mean, you'll know the you'll know your lines by heart. Yeah. And like, that's not I'm sorry, that's not possible. Nothing in this book rhymes, you know, yeah. <laughs> and if it doesn't rhyme, it's impossible to memorize. It's like, no, no, no. Actors do it all the time. So then, <laughs> you know, I got to learn that practice, too. Right. That's, I mean, that's amazing. So, so that you, you started helping me think about the next part of the process, right? So moving it from, from, you know, reading and music, right, into a full blown, blown performance for stage, right? Mm -hmm. So that transition and that transition of moving, moving the book from something very private, right, about your own family, about the kind of racial politics of Sweden, um, racial politics of the U.S., like over a long period of history, like taking all of that kind of private family history and moving that onto a public stage, like, and in this different format, right? So how did you experience that in the Swedish version of it? Like, what was the impact of that movement for you? And what do you think it was the impact on the Swedish audience? My first thought was like, nobody's going to come to see this. My second thought was, it's going to be really, I'm really vulnerable. I'm really out there because if people start throwing things, uh, then, you know, where are we going to go? Where are we going to run? You know? <laughs> so those are two things because, I, and I've had a lot of practice in ex trying to explain in, in short term Sweden to, and what Sweden feels like as, as a black person here to people in the United States and people in other countries. But, Race is not, race is barely a word that's used in the Swedish uh, language. There is a word for it, ras, but it's never used. And Swedish ears are so unused to hearing uh, uh, the word race being used. They're, they're more used to hearing the word black being used. But they're very, uh, they're very unfamiliar with. Uh, talking about white and whiteness. Mm -hmm. So that's why I didn't know how it would land and how provocative just, use it, right. just using these words. And especially when you strip something of music. I mean, I've done, I've written lots of songs about, about mm -hmm. these things, about race, about identity, about racism, about Swedish society and racism in Swedish society. But it's something about, you know, music, even if the music is, is it has a, uh, uh, a, a, a gravity to it, you know, yeah. it's, it's very serious and, 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 and gloomy. It still kind of sweetens whatever is being said in a way that, 
you know, ears are a little more accepting. But when you strip that away, it's like, can I stand on a stage, which is, and there's no other sound other than me speaking these words, and will people accept that? Uh, that was something I was like, I'm really, I, I was really, uh, uh, well, both nervous and excited to see how that was gonna, how that was gonna land with people. And this, it's not too long ago. I mean, it premiered in 2017. I, I honestly think I would feel the same way if it was gonna, if, it was, if I was gonna do something similar today, like, wow, how is this gonna land? Because even in that short span of time, things have changed uh, in, in Sweden rapidly. And especially this summer, uh, you know, as it did globally, as the movement for black lives sprung out of, of uh, the United States and then just uh, uh, away. connected with black and brown bodies all over the world. I mean, you, I, I'm sure you guys saw it in the States that there were, there were protests in, in you know, one of the most beautiful moments was the people of Bristol pulling down the Edward Colston statue, the statue of the slaver. Um, you know, and that this would have never happened if it weren't for the movement for Black Lives coming out of the United States. The need and the uh, the need and the the, the pain and uh, the the well, just the need for it is is global. Um, so having said all that, I don't know how it would land today, um, where, where the, you know, the middle has moved to the right in, in a, in a, in a strong sense, but, but, and again, you know, my father was very adverse to me writing the book, you know, mm -hmm. he thought it was really a blatant, uh, uh, way of putting his and our family's business out in the streets in a way that he didn't appreciate. He was very open with that he didn't appreciate that. Well, he was there for the premiere in Sweden and all the, you know, when I met him after the show, he was really excited because there was music and the applause and, and you know, people came up and, and congratulated him. And so there was something in that, the, the taking in the, the stage, uh, of art that is performed on a stage and doing it together with other people that was less lonely and more. Um, right. Yeah. Uplifting and, and easier for him, mm -hmm. you know, than sitting in his in his easy chair alone, right. reading these words at a slow pace, you know. Yeah. It's so interesting that you talk about both the, the kind of vulnerability that you felt bringing into the stage and but in concert with the kind of after effect of the performance being over like kind of like a group and a communal activity. Right. Mm. I mean, so it's very personal, but it also has this kind of like community community formation in terms of the audience but also like after hearing the performance and being a part of it i think you create a different kind of community coming out of that mm. right which is something that your father seemed to feel um i want to talk about the moment when um i saw you right after you met jonathan right? <laughs> yeah so when, the, when the when the piece when you were thinking about or when it was going to be put up at harlem stage and you were looking for a director you know, mm. we had a we had a we had a meeting right after you'd met Jonathan. You came into Harlem stage, and I mean, all of the kind of like vulnerability that you say you were feeling in the Swedish context, right, was in that moment, right, completely overtaken by insane <laughs> excitement, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was yeah, really yeah. amazing. Yeah. Like, you know, you were just so full with. Mm with possibility and with excitement and with, mm. um, and it had so much to do, right, with, with, you know, being in Harlem, right? I mean, so much of your story and your father's story takes place here and, you know, has Harlem as this kind of like real, like, you know, um, kind of lodestar, right, of, of, of what's happening. Um, so I want you guys to say a little bit about what you, what you saw in each other, right? And what you saw about the possibilities <laughs> of this performance in, in the US, like in Sweden, mm. it's bringing a whole vocabulary, like a different vocabulary and a series of histories like into Swedish experience that um, that's really, really important. In the US, right, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a different, it's a different story. I mean, parts of it are more familiar, parts of it are not familiar at all. So I'm really interested to hear you guys talk about what you saw, right, in each other, 
right? What that excitement was about, right? And the, the kind of work that you wanted the book to do here in the US or the book performance, for, right? For, so, a, for anyone who's ever had the, the pleasure to, to speak with Jonathan, you know that, you know, when his light shines on you, it's just, I was just inspired. You know, we, we met at Harlem stage, for about half an hour, we didn't talk at all about that I wanted to do a play or, you know, he just, we just went on this, like, on this journey, you know, this half hour journey. And, and he started talking about Gore Island, which is a very powerful place in Senegal that, that I've also been to. And so we just met, you know, I just felt like I, I truly met him. And that's, that's one part of this man's, you know, magic, uh, and I and truly, after coming out of that room, I felt like, yeah, every everything is possible. You know, I can do this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, what I, I just want to chime in and say, and hi everyone, so great. I've been listening to the entire time and been totally elated, and it's really humbling because I didn't I didn't know all the reflections after uh, we met. <laughs> I just knew that synergy had happened, right? And mm. we had we had a convert like it's a new it's a new kind of idea that i've been thinking about of just like um someone introduced to me actually uh, what does it mean to show up as a hundred percent so a hundred percent jason showed up with this beautiful book a hundred percent i showed up with the pedagogy understanding of being a creative doula and having to help birth ideas and because of that we can create three about 300 percent right what is that 300 what is that new percentage that gets to be created when that one plus one equals three versus equaling two because two is standard practice two is kind of a space where we kind of know the end result three is where we get to have a conversation around innovation you get to have a conversation around like that's where transformation and healing get to come into play and i think that we both were in a space of wanting to be transformed we're both in a space of wanting to heal we're both in a space of trying to figure out what does that bridge look like that actually puts us all in community with each other mm -hmm. and that's why we didn't necessarily need to talk about the book we could talk about the book we actually need to talk about the <laughs> framing around what is what what is the what what is the aura that circles the book and what is the opportunities that circle the book that would allow for the book now to be elevated to a place that would allow for a theatrical, an American theatrical audience to engage with it. Um, mm. And I mm. think, and I think that's where that's where it became a beautiful, uh, it became a beautiful marriage in that in that first, mm. in that first like that first introduction. Um, and because I see myself as a doula, and I see myself as a as 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 a in, as, as the intermediary between creative ideation and mm -hmm. artistic manifestation, and that mm -hmm. and that like as very much I saw I can hear part of, as Jason saying the gift the part of my gift is to hear uh, sometimes yeah. the latent and and, and awaiting uh, ideas that want to burgeon out of artists, um, mm -hmm. and I am gifted if someone wants to say at just being able to be a um, to be in service of that. Uh, to mm -hmm. kind of silence my agenda and awaken the agenda of what needs to happen in the room, not the agenda of the individual or the or other parties, but what needs to happen so that this room right now can be filled with the healing possibility of what the, what we all can actually have happen. So um, mm -hmm. it was a beautiful like it was a beautiful conversation. It it was, <laughs> it was and I thank Colin Sage for like I really do thank Colin Sage for considering me to be a part of this journey. Um, mm. uh, because it was, it was a journey that wasn't in my purview, right? It was a journey. I don't necessarily see myself as a dramaturg, um, or as a person that works in that, in that, um, in that zeitgeist, even though I do like mm -hmm. to steward and nurture artists. Um, and so, uh, Harlem Stage helped to a really, from, from a vantage point outside of my institution, helped for me to see myself in a different vantage point and see how, uh, the cultivation of my pedagogy that I've been stu like 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 we have books like I gave I gave books there was a symbols book you remember this mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there, were, there, were, there no no there's a there there's a there is a there is a there is a there is a definite you were reading pedagogy this? that was oh. brought to play so <laughs> there were books that yes that that were a part of the process uh -huh. mm -hmm. those books mm -hmm. took us on a spiritual journey. And it was about the destination, it was about it was about creating a launching pad for a different kind of destination that allowed for us to look at the bones of this beautiful book, the bones of this beautiful theatrical offering that was already created, and really understand where does the muscle now lie, right? Right? Can mm -hmm. we talk about where 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 things might have now evolved? 
Um, exactly. Where, the where you yeah. were is not the conversation where we are. And are you mm. willing to sit with where we are, which is going to be uncomfortable because it's not where you were and where you might no, think exactly. the endpoint is now? Can we talk about the new endpoint? And like, I actually mm. have to say, through the gorgeous narrative of doing that, there was beautiful, there's like, we realized that this is an offering not for, not for the now space, but the future space. Like being the, mm. as I like to say about what I love about James Baldwin, and when you look at all of his um, essays, uh, mm. uh, it's really about an offering for the future, yeah. not an offering for the now. Yeah. And so, and so yeah. really generating and really understanding and pinning that for Jason, this is an offering for his child. Um, mm. and, and the end of this work has to be an offering for, for her to be able to hold all the different aspects of what's able to happen. And that was a growing space, right? From mm. where it was to where it is. Um, and I think, I think you, 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 you yeah. saw, like Jonathan, you, you rephrased uh, uh, some of the, like the, the conceptual idea of where, where this work wanted to go in a, in a deep way for me, because Jonathan introduced you know, c celebration and joy. <laughs> I think where, where the Swedish iteration of the stage performance is kind of, it's not a, it's, it doesn't, it, it kind of soliloquizes, you know, it's, mm -hmm. there's a sorrow in it, you know, and then it ends in me turning to my grandfather and speaking to him. Jonathan mm -hmm. introduced this concept of celebration and joy and being, you know, your ancestor's wildest dream and the celebration of survival and resilience and courage that it took to make me, and then in turn, that I then offer to my daughter. So it really just reshaped the whole idea of where this, like, where this performance wanted to go, like where it was, what it was leaning towards, aspiring to. You know, one that is so fascinating to me because Jason, when I was reading the book first in Swedish and then in English, and in particular, when I was reading the English version along with um, a whole bunch of other texts that, that I was teaching at the same time I was teaching your book, right? And, and mm. also creating a playlist. What was so interesting to me is that I felt like exactly what you say, that the Swedish, the Swedish version of the book is in some ways documentary, right? Mm. There's a lot of it that's documentary and trying to get there. Mm. The English language version of the book for me is, is slightly is slightly different, right? And then when you add the music, I felt like, you know, one of the things that was so important to me, especially when you came into my class that one day and and um, performed, right, mm. was mm. was that joy piece, right? Uh, book doesn't yeah, include right. music, right? The performance no. does include music, right? And then mm. if you tap into what the music, what any black music is doing with black experience right mm -hmm. is that it's processing it right and trying to get to a certain moment of transcendence even if sometimes that is just a laugh right uh, <laughs> like kind of ironic absurd mm -hmm. laugh like huh you know i mean so i just that's so beautiful that you know that jonathan saw you know in some ways in this place and, and maybe that's really african-american too that could that just be really african-american African mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. like is the is the, is the desire and in some ways the drive to get to that place the ability yeah to be able to celebrate despite it all yeah you know for for the sake of survival yes and and when we also think about the idea so i've been i've been currently uh really deep diving into the theology around ring shouts um, and just thinking about how ring shouts were um, really a space when the oppression, everything was around us and the question around joy showing up in this moment that we are now currently living in, can joy still show up? And even thinking about the book, how does joy show up inside of this very complicated notion of where does race, um, when does blood, where blood memory comes and blood memory has pain inside of it? How does all of that live inside, uh, live inside of the human experience? And when I think about how this piece brings music in conversation and puts someone in the center, Jason, yeah. centered mm -hmm. circle, like in a circular almost motion around music and community. There's mm -hmm. almost a ring, there's almost an essence of a circular ring shout happening where in this moment, oppression doesn't have to lend itself 
to actually telling us what we, who we are and how we be. In yeah. this moment, we actually can, we actually can uh, uh, unearth that and actually be free, own our bodies, own our story, own mm -hmm. our spaces and be complicated in who we are. Um, mm -hmm. And there's just a beauty inside of what music is able to do, I think, inside of the African and the Black diasporic mm -hmm. tradition mm -hmm. of helping to tell story, of actually telling story, right. um, mm -hmm. of being a theatrical device, because it breaks open and awakens, I think, a lot of ways, the whole uh, circular system of who we are, um, of who we are as humans, not just as Black people, but who we are as humans, to start to actually engage, instead of just from an intellectual space or from an uh, ideology space of just viewing, our bodies start to now begin to be a part of the conversation. So I think that that's also something really beautiful when we start talking about the why, how does joy show up in spite of, how, does, how can joy show up in spite of? I mean, yeah. music's ability to move us, we're never closer to God than when we're, you yeah. know, dance, dance. You know, when, when, when we dance, that, that, that same as you're describing in the ring, shout, ring shouts, uh, all are like time doesn't affect us even yes. in the same way. Music, music makes its own time and, yes. and, and music creates a space of freedom and, and holiness almost, you know. Uh, and there's a lot to be said for, you know, just, the drum in itself, you know, when yeah. you hear a hip, when you hear a hip hop song or you hear, you know, uh, Elvin Jones play, you know, you hear a jazz song, um, you know, the drums are there and they're hitting you and it's visceral and it's like, you know, it's both in your gut, it's in your mind, it's in your soul. When you hear, you know, when you're in Senegal or Ghana and you hear the original drums, like the drums, the, the pa there's just, there's, pa there's power in music too. Yeah. Uh, both in its ability to move the crowd, but also moving the players, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and moving the air. Uh, yeah. I, mm. I think, yeah. yeah. So we don't, we wouldn't be if it weren't for, for that, you know, for having that space, you know, music. So, so yeah. The, the meeting between storytelling and, and also having it set to music, that's one thing that I'm still very, you know, excited about. And I've, I grieved for a long while after I went back to Sweden and, you know, really landed in the fact that this work was not going to happen as I, as I had expected it would and opening on March 30th. But that, because all the great music that we wrote for it, like now it's unperformed, you know, and, and it's still in the... You know, it's still in this little treasure chest, and I was so uh, I, I'm now I've, I've I think I've grieved enough about it. Now I'm trying to move back into the excitement and anticipation of when I get to uh, open that up and share that music with uh, with the audience at Harlem Stage. So I want to think about right. I mean, one of the advantages, that maybe the only advantage to postponing right this mm -hmm. right is precisely what you were saying before, right? Um, is that you're experiencing your own story and even the performance, right? In, at different moments, right? At really different moments in our shared history, right? As, um, as kind of humans on the earth, right? We're in a pandemic right now as black people, right? In terms of the movement for black lives and, um, you know, kind of uprising for racial and social justice, right? This, this performance now is gonna happen in a really different moment. I mean, March, you know, the day before you left in March, things were really different, right? Yeah. Than they are yeah. now, right? And mm -hmm. when, you, when the performance happens at Harlem stage, we'll be in a different world, right? Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I really wanted us to think uh, together the, the, about- The work it. also takes a, 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 you know, in Sweden, being a black person in Sweden is, yeah. is a lot of, and and being an active or being an activist or being yeah, yeah. A, a a creative who talks about identity, race, and, and you know, and human rights and equality, is a lot of the time you're spending uh, uh, explaining concepts mm -hmm. to people who are unfamiliar with them, either unfamiliar but willing to listen or uh, unfamiliar and not willing to listen. Mm -hmm. But this the work turns here to a more initiated. Uh, I, to more initiated ears, I think. And Jonathan, you were so, uh, you know, tenderly and brilliantly 
shepherding me into that space where it's not as I'm not explaining uh, uh, right. that racism exists and this is what it feels like uh, because I don't need to for for the audience that's going to come to Harlem stage. And I and think also, even, oh, yeah, so and, sorry. And, and, also, and also there's a larger thing about how, why the black body has to do that in general. Why do we mm. have to spend some of our time on this planet to explain an existence that was con that sometimes constructed against our will, an existence that we are working to find liberation from and to spend the time I mean, Toni Morrison has the, I mean, Toni Morrison talks about it. It's just like, that is the work of the oppressor. That is the oppressor actually having its way inside yeah. of our precious time on this planet. Yeah. And so there was so much more beauty that, um, that Jason had in the book. Jason wanted to actually free himself to say. And mm -hmm. um, I think it, I appreciate you actually uh, allowing me, Jason, to actually uh, um, mm -hmm. poke holes at that and be like, hey, let's free ourselves. Let's be free. Let's get liberated. Mm -hmm. Let's get mm -hmm. liberated inside of this. Let's not be belabored. Let's not let the white gaze impose mm -hmm. upon how we need to be so that by the time you're done with this text, it is, it is actually an anthropological uh, vessel that actually is a time capsule of who you are. Because mm -hmm. that labor is not necessarily a time capsule of who you are. That labor is the time capsule of the oppressor who wants to make sure that you always know that you have to feed their box instead of feeding mm -hmm. your exactly yeah. wow. that's the that's celebration yeah that, you know that's all under that you know it, it, in that word you know and that that really was a, a a radical idea for me to take in and really feel but in conversation with jonathan it it, it you know it just went into me in a way that i i truly understood where and and that i'm so grateful for because it really gave it, it just gave the work new purpose, you know, it repurposed it. Uh, Repurposing, was it, was it, um, was it, I mean, obviously it was spiritual and it was, and it was about kind of like how it felt, but how did hmm. it, did it change the form? I'm curious. It, it, it didn't really change the form in itself, no, but it was about what, pivoting, but it, it, changed it's it's like it just shifted the gaze to right. where are we are we okay. looking forward or are we looking backward okay and also just like like what jonathan was saying and is this is this for me is this for us or is this a a, a react a reaction mm -hmm. you know whereas right. i think it went from being more reactive to being celebratory you know and and again you know while writing the book and, and it's you know, reading a book takes, takes a while, you know, it takes the hours it takes for you to read it. And it's a slow process. Uh, it's not fast. It, there's no fast food consumption of a book. There's also no fast way of writing a book. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, <laughs> slaves to slaves to fashion is a, uh, is a dire, is it, is a tome, you know, no, it's, it's a, not, one. But, uh, but, but it, I'm yeah, still working it's on a, the next one. So it's a comprehensive work too. So you, you know this uh, um spending time but spending those hours were delightful you know writing uh and i really felt that the the ancestors were with me you know not always but a lot of times they were with me and it was it was in you know it was in collaboration with them that that i i think i was able to write the book and that re that kind of rephrasing that jonathan helped me find of of the stage performance Right. became much more of that, you know. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's also almost as, after my daughter was born, I'm, you know, I have one foot with the ancestors now, you know. Right. I'm no longer the latest, uh, I'm no longer the spearhead of, of my line in a sense, she is, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm almost, I'm starting to join their ranks and saying, we're with you, you know. This is who we were and, and, and this is where we, this is what we felt and, and now go, you know? Yeah. How powerful is that? I mean, for me, that reflection, how powerful of a space is that for us to actually sit in? That we understand that even while our bodies are tethered to this planet, 
our actions are a part of a reaction to really bear it away, right? That mm-hmm. like that like like when I when I talk when I talk about I think this is so powerful and beautiful and humbling actually um, because it means that you live in a space of service that your mm-hmm. actions and acts are a space of service service not for yourself service for a future a future that you want to have like like how do you how do you recycle like you know what I mean the question like there's so many mm-hmm. other questions now start to come into play how do you compost how what what how do you um how what energies do you use how do you take care of the environment. How do you make sure that you feed, feed your body correctly? How do you make sure that you go through the X, Y, and Z scenarios that you need? And so I think it's just a beautiful offering that, that you're talking about, even from a way of just living your life, <laughs> Jason. That's mm-hmm. not just around like this, this work in particular, but it's like, how are you living your life to make sure that, that it's not one of selfishness, but a selflessness that allows for, for humility to live in the center? So... I, I just I just wanted to uplift that because I was just mm, dope. Mm, mm. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm I'm just so I mean so curious as to like in terms of the the selflessness part of it and the the piece as a kind of you know service to everyone who's going to witness it and be a part of it like what it will mean right in that future moment when it's performed right, um, here in Harlem. I just, I think that's just really, really exciting to think about because I do think that what's been going on, right, with the movement for Black Lives here in the United States is we saw, you know, this kind of like infographics in the paper where there wasn't a single state that didn't have, right, a protest or, or, you know, an uprising no matter how small in the United States. We know about all of the kind of like, you know, solidarity demonstrations as well as like locally manifested movements for black lives in Europe, right? We know about those. We know about similar things in South. I mean, it's just so interesting to think about because Jason, your story does really, you know, it spans continents and time, right? So how is it going to, I mean, not even land, but because the landing sounds like a, like a moment a kind of distinct moment in time, but what is it going to make possible, right? Um, in that, future moment is really exciting to me. Yeah, I mean, and something happened this summer, at least, you know, that was very noticeable in Sweden was that the laying bare of, of kind of the, the complicity that we all share in, in the, the, the construct of, of racial hierarchy and racism, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and dealing with bias that that is kind of omnipresent. Uh, and and for, for Sweden, that was, I'd say new. Mm-hmm. And it has led to deeper conversations at, at, with un, in unexpected rooms, in a sense, you know? Yeah. Uh, because racism here was so long owned by the, the alt-right, the, right, you know, right. people far out on the right. Now, all of a sudden, you know, people in the middle are like, wait a minute, we're not, we're, what? we're not a part of this. Mm-hmm. But all of a sudden, we're, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And so where we come out on the other end, like where, where will we be? You know, like uh, 2021, uh, you know, the United States, Sweden, the world. I think this work at least is in its best, is in its best place for those reasons that, that, you know, for those reshapings that Jonathan helped me find and, and, and explained and, and showed to me, you know, of celebration and joy. Like no matter what happens between now and then, right. th- that will be like, a, 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 that will be relevant and, and, uh, and necessary and, and actually be giving a gift to the audience. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah. What do you anticipate? Oh, I mean, I just have to say that this piece, um, and so, and, and, and thinking about what this piece unearths and what this book unearths, as far as a, a piece, a part of the transatlantic blackening, blackening the transatlantic so that we actually see the connected tissues of how we are our brothers and sisters keeper. 
um, how we are joint heirs of, um, of having to heal um, and joint heirs. I mean, it does, it does this really beautiful opportunity um, of looking at and helping us look at some of the psychic distances that have actually hurt and um, created trauma, um, historical trauma amongst us diasporically um, mm -hmm. and amongst us as, as, as Black African Americans also. Um, mm -hmm. I think that uh, what was beautiful, so, so beautiful about the book and even the theatrical work that people will see one day, um, <laughs> is, it, it is, is this space of giving perspective around a Black African-American um, story, right. um, dealing with slavery, dealing with um, X, Y, and Z. And as we think about the global uh, space that we now live in, when we think about the political space we now live in, I think um, perspective becomes the key. What yeah. vantage point am I making my decisions from? And what vantage point will I lean into to make sure that those decision points um, are not uh, keeping up systemic oppression and systemic systems uh, that, uh, that hurt, um, that undermine, um, and that keep capitalism in its place of power. Hmm. Also, I think today it's so obvious that the, the to people of the diaspora, so any, any black or brown person with, you know, that identifies as part of the diaspora and who's outside of continental Africa, uh, the idea of the nation is really irrelevant in a sense, mm -hmm. because the similarity of the experiences is really, you know, of course, there's culture and so forth. And that that's very important. And culture can be endemic, depending on if you're in Sweden or if you're in if you're in New York City. But but then there's something that transcends that and what binds us together. And that's really my my biggest excitement about A Drop of Midnight, both the book and the stage performance it was bringing the like the story boomeranging back to the United States and and that for me was you know a dream that you know I knew I wrote the book in Swedish I did the stage performance in Swedish and, but at one day you know it'll travel back across the Atlantic because my family's story is so much a transatlantic one you know yeah. from my ancestors being stolen from Africa to you know uh, to my father migrating to Sweden to find a, a space of opportunity, to me uh, uh, being inspired by and constantly going on these pilgrimages back to the back across the Atlantic, and then bringing stories back to Sweden to write about, and then that now coming back home in a sense. Mm -hmm. That's great. Monique is telling us that we need to wrap up. Oh, already? <laughs> <laughs> James King is saying, wrap it yeah. up. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hmm. You know, we could speak for uh, another hour because there's so much richness in this book, which I have to highlight again, and you can uh, find it on Amazon. It was released on March 1st of this year. This is uh, part one of this conversation series around a drop of midnight. So please stay tuned and uh, check Harlem stage dot org for more information about this project and more. I want to thank Jonathan McCrory and Monica Miller and of course Jason Diakate. Diakate. Thank you so much. Diakate. We'll see you guys soon. Thank you so Bye. much Monica. Thank you Jonathan. Thank you Monique. Yes, love, love, love. I know. Love. That was fun. <laughs> <laughs>